So we're back with lesson 11. We're making progress that we can see our filter is working. And if you want to check this out, what you may want to do is go ahead and create another user account. So I created two. I have user at gc.ca. I also have test at test.com. So if you register and then log in in different browsers with your two different logins, go to the My Artist page, you're going to get different results. So with my user account, all these artists are tied to it. With my other account, testattest.com, there are no artists attached. Now we need to make a few more changes here to complete this. There's several things we need to do. Number one, when we add a new artist right now, there's no code I mean, to, to tie the artist to our user ID. We just updated these manually in the database last week. So we want to modify our save page to grab the user ID from our session variable and include that as a parameter when we are saving. That's one thing we need to do. We should probably, we, when our user's logged in, we should add a link to my artists in the nav bar. We should also make sure that when we go to delete an artist, that we, that the user that's logged in owns that artist record. So if I'm logged in as test.test.com, test at test.com, I shouldn't be able to delete an artist that belongs to another user. Okay, so we're going to implement all of these things. So first, let's start with our save our, uh, oh, we also, as Mike suggested, the My Artist page also needs to be private. So the very first line of My Artists, we need to require our auth file. My Artist is a page you only get when you're logged in. If you're not signed in, you cannot access My Artists. So make sure that this page is private, very first line is that it should include our auth file. Now we want to go to the Save Artist page. And we're going to add in both our insert and update, we need to, let's just see here, do we have, okay, we've got auth, so we're already calling session start. So inside here, I'll create a variable just for simplicity called user ID equals So we're going to read the user ID from the session variable, and then we need to include it in both our insert and update, as well as binding it. So in insert, we're going to add this to our column list, and we're going to add a user ID parameter. We're going to do the same thing. Um, actually, you know what, uh, yeah, for just for simplicity, we'll do it in the update as well, I guess. I mean, we're not really changing the value, but that way we can bind the parameter. And then we're going to add it down here as well. So we can test this out now. What I'm going to do is I'm going to add the same artist, um, maybe even under both accounts. Well, it doesn't matter. Actually, I'm going to try this first with my test at test.com account. So we've declared a local variable, 
populated it from our session variable. We've included it in our insert as well as in our update. And we've bound that parameter. So I'm going to try first with my test at test.com account. I'm going to add an artist and it should show up on the main, both on the main artist page for everyone and on the my artist page here. Artists. So I'm going to add somebody else. I'll add an artist. So it tells me artist is saved. When I go to the master list, Lumineer shows up here. And now I'm going to go to my artists. So now with this account, I've got one artist of my own, which I can delete. If I jump down and look at my other user, so now I'm in as user.gc.ca. When I go to the master artist list, I can now see the Lumineers, even though this is not my artist. But on the My Artist page, right, I don't see that because I haven't added that artist. They're not mine. So this is working the way we want it to. We'll need to deal with our nav bar and we'll also need to deal with delete. So here's my artist ID, 5013. With my test account, I should be able to delete this. But with my user account, I shouldn't be able to delete that artist because it doesn't belong to me. Okay, so Dominic, you've, I'll leave the code up for a minute here. So check carefully. You can also disable your try catch block temporarily and let the page crash. That'll give you some more information about why it's failing. So all of this code is inside a try catch. Could comment out the try and the catch and let it fail. So our next step is to go back to our header. We're going to rename the artist link to say all artists. And then we're going to add a my artist link that is only going to be visible to authenticated users. An anonymous user won't see the my artists. We'll go back to our header. Our artist link here, we're going to change, I'm going to change the text of that link to say all artists. And then in the main navigation, I'm going to add a little block of PHP code. Now again, we're going to check our session variable. So I'm actually going to move this code to call session start, it's going to happen first, so I can put it here. I'll move it out of this block. So session start is now going to get called up here instead. And then again, we can say, if not empty,
So I will echo out a link. The link will go to my artists and it will say my artists. So when we are logged in, we'll see the my artist link. If we're not logged in, we won't see it. Okay, so I've renamed the text on our artist link to say all. We're going to call session start if we need to. And if our user is logged in, then we're also going to add to the left side of our nav bar, we're going to add the My Artists link. Let's try this out. I'm actually going to use three browsers for this. I'll be logged in into my two different accounts in Firefox and Chrome, and then I can use Edge as an anonymous user. So now I get this. I'm logged in with my test account. All artists shows me kind of my read only and it shows everything in the database. These records are mine. This record belongs to someone else. When I go to my artists, sorry, other way around. I go to my artist, I get this artist with the ability to edit and delete. In Chrome, all artists shows me the complete list, and my artist shows me everybody but the Lumineers because that belongs to the other user account. I'll try it in Edge as well. As an anonymous user, my artist isn't here. All I get is the complete list. If I try to go to my artist here when I'm not logged in, I'm asked, hey, log in. We can't show you the list of my artists until we know who you are. And now we need filters on editing and deleting. So for example, here in my artist, I've only got one, the ID 5013. But if I change the URL, I can load an artist that isn't mine. So we also need this filter on artist details and on delete artists to make sure that somebody cannot update or delete an artist that they don't own, that's not their record. So we'll go first to the artist details. thinking about how we want to do what we want to do. So I think what we'll do is we'll modify our query here so that not only are we finding the right artist, but the user ID must match our session variable. So we're going to add one more parameter here, which is our user ID. And 
and we'll add an AND. And we'll bind the parameter user ID. So this is going to prevent us from accessing an artist that belongs to another user. Now, what should happen in this case? So let's, again, I'll just stimulate the scenario. I'll save my changes here. So I'm logged in, I have a valid account, but artist 5013, this is the only one I should be able to access. If I change my ID and go here, oops, we'll fix that in a minute. But what, what should happen here? So I've fetched a record, but that record, yeah, probably redirect to error or redirect to an unauthorized page. Maybe I'll create a, create a page that's like our error. So here's what we're, let's test this. We'll say, if empty, so if it doesn't fetch anything, so I'm going to create a little if else. If our query doesn't fetch anything, um, yeah, we could throw an error or we could return to not found. Um, Yeah, I guess we could just go to the error page. That's okay. Um, so we'll disconnect. We don't need that. We can drop the database connection. We'll call header location error. And we'll call exit. We'll try this. We'll see if that works. So if I try to manipulate the artist ID To load the details for an artist that's not mine, I should go to the error page. We'll see if this works. So again, I'll go to mine. I can look up my own, but if I change that ID, I get, the, I get an error. So that behavior is okay. We're going to do the same thing or similar on the delete page. So again, we shouldn't be able to delete an artist that isn't ours. So we've added again our user ID from our session variable. We've added it as a parameter to our query. And then we're doing a little error checking. so that we can only retrieve that artist if we're the ones who added the artist to the database. If another user added it, we can't modify it. So we're gonna to go to delete, and I'm gonna do the same thing here. And we'll add an and And again, we're going to bind the parameter. And this will just be our user ID variable. Now, we may get a message saying deleted if we try to delete someone else's artist, but it, will, it won't delete. 
it's only going to work if this user account owns this artist. So again, just to prove this, I've got 5012 here. It belongs to my user account. In my test account, we go to delete and try 5012. It says the artist is deleted, but it isn't deleted. Blink-182 is still here. So I can't delete an artist unless I'm the owner of that artist. So if I want to delete Oscar Peterson, it's mine, my record. So now it's deleted. Okay, so we've secured access to resources here both at the page level, determining who is allowed in to see what pages, but we've also granted access controls on individual records. So every artist that gets added, it belongs to a user, and only that user has the ability to make changes or to delete that artist record. Um, and we did have to play around with some of the idiosyncrasies of PHP session management that we actually have to call session start, even if we just want to remove the session. And yet we can't call session start multiple times in a single page request. So we need to ensure with this logic, we need to ensure that it's never called more than once on one page request. But now we've got the security implementation how we wanted to. Now this is our first level. This is around authentication and ownership of data. We're not really implementing authorization with different permission levels. Um, we'll do that next semester with ASP.NET where the security is a lot more robust and yet much simpler to code. Does anybody have any questions or anything we, you'd like to review about the work we've done to secure this? If there's anything you'd like, any files you'd like me to display or you've got questions, let me know. Okay, thank you, Don. Yes, Dominic, I will upload to GitHub. Yama, I'm glad you mentioned that. That's what we're going to talk about next. It's going to be a little more of a discussion. Um, so, yeah, we you need to spend some time talking about SSL. So that's all the coding we're going to do for today. But we, there's a couple of resources we want to talk about. And we will we'll be done, I think, well in advance of 2 o'clock. This is going to complete it off. Okay, so the code should be on GitHub now. So I want to talk about SSL, which is a critical topic when we are building applications. Um, really good job interview question. So what is SSL and why do we need it? What do you already know about SSL?
how would you answer that question in, an inter in a job interview? What is SSL and why is it important in web development? Okay. <laughs> okay, that's fine, Alex. We're going to talk about it. This is going to be the, about the last five minutes of your life that you won't be able to answer that question. First of all, does anybody know what SSL stands for? What does that acronym mean? Thank you, Yom. It stands for Secure Sockets Layer. Okay, when I look at this page in D2L, I can see that it's using SSL. Um, how can we, how can you tell? Right, okay, thanks Mike we see that the protocol rather than being HTTP is HTTPS. So what is it actually, what's the difference? So if we've got SSL, not only do we see HTTPS, but we get this little lock symbol. Thank you, Tuani. So HTTPS means our traffic between the web server and my browser is encrypted. It's encrypted end to end, that's right, Alex. So as Alessio said, by default, HTTP traffic is sent in plain text. So any hacker that intercepts your request or server response can read the data. So for example, a login page on your banking portal, they used HTTP and a hacker intercepted your form submission, they could read your uh, account number and password, for example. So HTTPS, let's just look, works. So when we add SSL to HTTP, it means our traffic is encrypted between our any user device and our web server. Uh, things like packet sniffers. Um, keep in mind, those things take every request, right? And when I load a page, Connor, so when I load a page from D2L, I'm making a request from my browser to my internet service provider, which is Rogers. And then Rogers has to figure out where does this domain name live? Where is it hosted? And that request might make a bunch of stops on the internet before it arrives here. And then the request hits the Lakehead server at wherever it's hosted. And then it comes all the way back with HTML that shows up in my browser. So there can be a number of stops there. Right? It's, not a, it's not a direct path. Um, and there is a way, I think, it would, how would we do it? I think it's called trace route. Free trace route. Okay, so let's see from here to go to, let's say, Lakehead from my machine here in South Barry using my Rogers internet, we can actually see the route this request takes. Yes, Connor, that's the right idea, right? Here's a, a whole series, you know, I don't know where these things go. I don't know where they are. So every request you make, it's going to look like this, right? 13 stops between my machine and Lakehead to serve a page from D2L, there and back. So there's a lot of opportunity for vulnerability if that traffic's not encrypted. So we should be using SSL for every website, even if the site is not secure. Now, Dominic, basically that's our only option is to use SSL. Yeah, that is the standard. So using SSL is required on every modern website, even if your website is just plain HTML, there's nothing sensitive, there's a database, there's no login, you still need SSL and here's why. Number one, because your browser, here's what happens.
First of all, browsers will mark all sites as not secure. Right? Even my, well, this is localhost, so it's okay. But any site that doesn't use HTTPS, your browser, so in Chrome, for example, it'll put a, uh, a line through the lock. Sorry, Firefox, Chrome will show not secure in red. So that's a good way to scare people away from the site. So browse, your browsers indicate. Another factor, which you can read about here in this link, is that for the last seven or eight years, Google also factors SSL into your search engine rankings. So Google will want you to use SSL even if 82% so of people won't browse an unsecured website, even if your website doesn't require any real authentication, right? This is how it shows up in Chrome, for example. Okay, so you need an SSL certificate for every website you publish, and there's several ways you can get an SSL certificate. The best way, the easiest way, is there's now there's a free service called Let's Encrypt. Many web hosts support Let's Encrypt. These are free certificates that are renewable every 90 days. Okay, so I use them. One of the hosting companies that I host with, they support Let's Encrypt. So here's my own little, I just redid this a little while ago. Not very fancy, just a simple single page WordPress site, but it's using Let's Encrypt. So it's using HTTPS. When you click on the lock, it says my connection is secure. That Let's Encrypt is the SSL issuer. I've got a certificate for the next couple months, which I can view, and it gives me information about the, so what domain it is attached to, and the fingerprinting encryption. So we can see this for any site, D2L, so it's using, it's hosted on Amazon Web Services, so they've issued the SSL, and we can see. You also want to make sure your certificates don't expire, because people get ugly errors in their browser saying the site is not secure. They see messages like this. If you let an SSL certificate expire. So Let's Encrypt is a great service, but not all web hosts support it. Some web hosts, like these guys, for you Andre DeGrasse fans out there, these guys sell SSL certificates for the low, low price, a one-year certificate is $125. So that's a lot more than free. Now you get more with it. Um, it performs greater level of validation. There's also warranty, etc. But GoDaddy doesn't offer you free. So their SSL certificates are extremely expensive. If your website is hosted on GoDaddy, and I have some clients who already set up their own hosting plans and they went to GoDaddy because they had seen the ads, saw the names, this is the only option you cannot get a cheaper certificate on GoDaddy. They will only sell you their own certificates, which are expensive. Now, you pass these costs on to your customer. You don't pay these costs, but we are responsible for setting up SSL whenever we publish a website. Now, there are other options. There are some hosts that will sell you their own certificate that don't support the free ones from Let's Encrypt. For those, I will typically buy certificates here at Namecheap. So their one-year prices start around $13 Canadian. And again, they have different levels with different levels of warranty, and you can compare them all. So you can buy cheap ones here, and then you would work together with the hosting company to configure and install the certificate. But this is your responsibility. Your customer is not going to do this on their own. You have to do it. And then the other thing you need to do 
is you need to ensure that all requests, and there's an article about how to do it in PHP with code, you need to make sure that any HTTP requests are automatically redirected to HTTPS. So here's how you would do it, for example, in PHP. You would check the server global array for HTTPS, and if it's not set and it's not equal to on, you would redirect to the same page but using HTTPS. So just to show you how this works, if I try and reload my own homepage, I take out the S and hit enter. The server is set to automatically force all requests to use HTTPS. Yes, Andrew, I actually use HTTPS everywhere. There's, I use it in, um, in Firefox as well. So if I go to a page that doesn't have HTTPS, it will force it. But most users won't have that extension. And you don't want them to go to the website that you've spent a lot of time working on and have the browser market as not secure and scare them away. Okay, so whether you're using Let's Encrypt or a cheap certificate like this one or an expensive certificate like this one, Every site should have it for these reasons, even if the site has nothing sensitive on it. It's just a static site where all users can do is read your HTML. You still need SSL. Okay, now somebody asked in my morning class, a related question, they said, well, you know, if I don't want to go to GoDaddy to host and pay $125 a year for SSL, where can you host? So I put a couple links here. These are host, two hosting companies I've used for many, many years. Host Papa is a little less expensive. And one of the things I like about them is they allow you to host multiple domains, but manage them all with one login. So I can build different websites for different clients and I don't have to create a separate login to manage each one. I have one login and I can manage all of my client domains in one central control panel, which I really like. Um, they've got data centers all over in five different countries, including in uh, Burlington, Ontario. I've also for many years dealt with new tech web hosting. They're based in Phoenix, Arizona. They're a little more expensive. They don't support that model of a single login managing different accounts. So you'd have to create a new, like different accounts for each domain. The great thing about new tech is most web hosting companies, well, first of all, many modern hosting companies don't offer 24 hour a day telephone support. It's all email and ticketing. And sometimes you need to be able to get on the phone and yell at somebody when you need something right away. I've learned this the hard way. Um, the second thing about new tech is not only they have phone support, but the people who answer the phone are not just call center representatives. Everybody who answers the phone is a network technician. So many hosts, when you deal with their frontline support, they're basically message takers. They can't actually solve anything that might be wrong if there's a problem on the server. At new tech, all of the reps are certified network engineers, and they actually have access to fix things on their servers. So they're a little more expensive, but you get better tech support. Gabriel, databases hosting is usually part of the hosting platform. So for example, uh, I can sign into my portal. So the databases would be part of your hosting control. So you could set up or create databases. usually within the hosting control panel. So there's a control panel and if I need to go and create a new domain or create a database, I would do it in, in here. So for example, here's my own domain and there's a database in here. So I can manage the domain, manage the email, and there's databases in here. 
So if I wanted to go and create a database, I can do it in, in here. Well, Dominic, there's two kinds of hosts. So this is a traditional hosting platform where you pay a flat fee every month for a certain amount of resource, like certain amount of memory, certain amount of bandwidth, certain amount of storage space. Amazon and hosts like Microsoft Azure, which we're gonna work with in the fall, those are cloud services. And cloud services have a different model. It's pay per use. So the advantage is you can scale up. If you have many users, you can scale up your resources automatically. The downside is your costs are not fixed. So it can be much more expensive to host in a cloud environment. Um, I mean, these guys offer SSL certificates as well. That, so they support Let's Encrypt here. So I have a free Let's Encrypt certificate with these guys. I can do that. I, I've got a Let's Encrypt certificate here. I have one. Okay, so we will work with some cloud providers next semester. We'll work with the Microsoft Cloud. There was one other thing I just wanted to show you briefly. It was a recommendation from a former student who then worked as a web app, as an application security manager for Royal Bank for a long time. And that's this, you should at least be aware of it. For those of you who are interested in security, the OWASP project, it's a nonprofit foundation. And every few years they put out a list of the most common web application security risks. So you can see the list from 2017 updated last year and then they describe in detail how common these vulnerabilities are. 94% of applications in their survey had some form of broken access control. So they describe, you know, things like permitting viewing someone else's account, for example. Um, forcing authenticated pages as an unauthenticated user. And then they describe the fixes. So the best practices to prevent some of these things. So they talk about things like injection. Well, we've dealt with some of these things already. So using things like parameters in our SQL calls. Yep, it's true, Alex. Right, use parameters, use server-side input validation. So some of these best practices we've already followed, but this is a useful resource for you. And certainly there's lots and lots of work for web developers who are well versed in application security. Okay, so I just leave that link there. I will encourage you to explore it. You should at least know what the OWASP project is if you get asked in a job interview. All right, um, actually, I just want to check one thing and then we're going to get out of here for today. So our assignment to, yes, it is due next week. So let me just update that. It shouldn't say you should submit it. So assignment two is due next week. There's no quiz this week. Okay, just working on your assignment. I have some office hours availability this week if you need help um, and you're free to send me an email. So no quiz. Next week is our last lesson. We're gonna look at file uploads. Um, and then we will also talk about our final exam. I'll have to check if we have a date yet for that. Okay, so you're free to go.
wrap up early, give you some time to work on your assignment. I can stick around in the room if you've got questions. And have a great week. Looking forward to seeing your assignments. I'll see you next week.